Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. We are delighted that you have joined us this afternoon to hear our outstanding speaker. I am Barbara Danforth and I am the Secretary of the Board of the City Club and Co-Chair of the City Club's Strategic Planning Committee. I'm in the business of executive search and one of our continuing challenges is finding minority candidates for the multitude of positions that require science, mathematics, or an engineering background. But all my colleagues and I can do is lament the problem. Our speaker today has created a solution. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. I am. I am delighted to be here, and Margaret is right. She was a freshman, a physics major, and I'll never forget that, and very smart. And I'm delighted to be here because there are a number of people I've met before because I've come and spoken before to see Hamptonians and my, Michael Salkin and others. Let me start by saying I got my name from my father. That's how I got my name, all right? I always remember that, and that's enough for me to say today. And he was a hardworking, wonderful man who had married my mother, and they had a great life together, old-fashioned kind of life together. I can tell you more later. The, the fact is that I am from a university that has students from 150 countries. And I think it is the international nature of the institution that has allowed us to have 75 biotech and IT companies on campus, for example, started by our faculty and PhD students, all the way to this idea of domestic diversity, African Americans and Hispanics, international diversity in the other, on the other hand. Uh, Baltimore, I say, is the upper south. One day we think like Philadelphians, the next day like people in Richmond. But I grew up in the Deep South, Birmingham. We know we are Southern in Birmingham. It's very interesting. And, and Southerners like stories, and I begin with a story. Um, I, I am touched by the notion that it is this year, as you think about this 100th anniversary for this club, that it was in 1962 that I began in the ninth grade. It never occurred to me that during this year I would find myself involved in something called civil rights, or, or that I would come to know or hear a Dr. King, and I never thought the world would be different from what it had always been. And for us, it had always been a very segregated world. What's significant about that is that all I liked was mathematics and eating good food, like bl blueberry pie. So I was getting fatter and smarter all the time, eating that. But when I heard Dr. King make the comment that even children understand the need to get involved to understand what they might do so that children could have the best possible education, I said to my parents, I wanted to do just that. And I ended up participating in that march, taking a group of kids and spending five days in jail. It was not a good experience in the sense that it was, quite frankly, very uncomfortable in many ways. And yet, it taught me that even children, Mr. Superintendent, even children can think critically about their future. I remember after we'd been there several days, Dr. King was there outside of the jail with all of our parents, and he said this, what you do this day will have an impact on generations yet unborn. I didn't understand it fully, but I knew that was something profound about that statement. All of you know that that period of the 60s was a time when more people began to go to college than ever before. And that came about because of a period in our history that had all of us thinking critically about the future of America. And I'd like to recommend a book to you. That book is entitled Freedom from Fear by David Kennedy, Stanford professor. And it, it talks about the period 1929 to 1945. And I've been saying this throughout the country that it is amazing if you've studied that period of the Depression and FDR, how much the language of that time is parallel to the language we see today. Whether it is about Main Street and Wall Street or it's about what happens with the common man or about whether we'll have enough jobs or what legislation will continue to be in, in, enacted, how the Supreme Court relates to Congress, how we get people on different sides of, of arguments to come together and discuss the issues. With many people saying, oh, the country will never be the same somehow, that the economy is going down the tubes. What FDR had that was perhaps the most important lesson for all of us was a sense of optimism 
and a belief in our country. And so when you think about 25 years, even two decades after the founding of this club, there you had President Roosevelt saying, we can find a way to make a difference. If you look at that painting, I was amazed when I thought about the fact that it was during that depression that, quite frankly, it was Eleanor Roosevelt who convinced people that we needed to, to invest in the arts and to talk about who we were, express who we were as human beings. Interestingly enough, I'm from a campus that people think of as science and engineering, and yet I need to tell you that Greek and Latin classes are full at 8 in the morning. And I'm very proud of that, and that we do the kind of theater that either depresses you or leaves you very upset. <laughs> we study Beckett, if you know theater. We always, we are, we are always looking at the dark issues somehow. And, and I like it because it, what it does is it gives balance to the work. And I start that way as I talk about math and science because I think it's very important as we look at the importance of, of what's happening with minorities and Americans in higher education, as we think about what happened in the 30s and then in the 60s and today, the fact is that we need people educated in all these disciplines. We need people who are strong in the humanities and arts and social sciences, and we need people in science and engineering. My mother always told us a story as I was growing up about growing up in a home where there were books at a time when there was no library for children of color below Birmingham, my city, the big city, Birmingham at the time, called Wetumpka, outside of Montgomery. And she said that the woman in the home where she had to work was kind enough to say, Maggie, when you finish your work, you can go into the library and read. And Mother would do just that. And I've told this story so many times, but it's at the heart of my, found, of my thinking about education. She said that the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed reading, the more reading she did. She said the problem with her girlfriends was they never read enough to become good at it and therefore only read when they had to. And she would watch their faces as they were reading and they'd be frowning and finally they'd push the book aside and say, this isn't interesting. Well, obviously, if you can't read well, it's not an enjoyable experience. It won't be interesting. Now, what's interesting is my mother decided at that point she knew exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life to become an English teacher. And she did just that. And one of her favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston. And the book, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And my mother would be quoting people, and I'm saying, Mama, why are you doing this, right? She, she's got me washing dishes, and she's quoting Zora Neale Hurston, right? <laughs> but now I remember those words, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men, I would say, and women. She was talking about two groups of people in our society, people like us, people who've seen many dreams fulfilled. And then she was talking about what Langston Hughes would have called dreams deferred people who tried and didn't make it. It occurs to me that the fundamental purpose of education is to help people to learn to dream about the possibilities and then to develop the skills and the values necessary to reach the dreams. You know, interestingly enough, in that period of the 30s, one of the most fascinating ideas as the 30s were coming to an end and the beginning of the 40s in 1944 was the GI Bill. Because all of a sudden, people had this idea, let's, after the war, let's have veterans come back to college. The people who fought that notion, and I say this to my fellow college presidents often now, were college presidents. They thought that it would make for what they called an academic a jungle of hobos if we allowed veterans into colleges. And the reason was that they hadn't seen it. If you haven't seen something, you tend to think it can't be done. And yet within two years, we had a million veterans in colleges. And that began to say to Americans, people, regular people can go to college. And so by the time 1965 came around, by the time we talked about early 1963, and when I'm marching and in 64, when you have Civil Rights Act, and you've got the Voting Rights Act in 65, and you're talking about legislation of all types, all of a sudden, we had many more people going to college. You know, when you think about elected officials for the first time, and in this great city, your mayor, uh, Mayor Stokes, and then a hero of mine who has inspired my work for more than 30 years, Congressman Louis Stokes. Would you please give him a round of applause?
You may not know this, but I can tell you this from studying the record. I don't know of any American who has done more to emphasize the importance of inclusiveness in science, in STEM, than this man. We have programs all over the country, hundreds of millions of dollars for years and years, focused on, at institutions to increase the number of young people from diverse backgrounds who can make it in science. He and I were together, one of the big national agencies in intelligence. They've got a scholarship program for him there. Wherever you go, you will find this name because he fought to say to people, if we want to be visionary about our future, we must not only help people get a college degree, we have to have more people in science and engineering. And so what I want you to think about is this notion of vision. It is interesting that in the 60s, most of us don't even realize only 10% of Americans had a college education. Only 10%. People say, well, what about breaking it down by race? Only 2% of blacks, but only 11% of whites. But you didn't need a college education at that time to have a reasonable job and take care of your families. Today, for the first time, we have moved to 30% of Americans with a college degree. Now, what's interesting is um, the fastest growing group in our population, we know, is, is Hispanic are still only at about 14 percent. African Americans have moved from 2 percent to almost 20 percent. Whites are now at about 34 percent. The, the, the best educated group in our country, Asian American, is at 50 percent. Now, I'll ask you a question that will sound politically incorrect. I'd rather have you angry at me than bored. Here we go. <laughs> How many of you believe that there are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children? Usually I get people frowning saying, how dare you? Don't you believe in your country? Oh, yeah, this is a great country. I don't know a country as great as ours. I think with all of our problems, we have come so far. Imagine a little colored boy in Birmingham in 1962 marching so he could go to a school where they didn't have hand-me-down books, being the president of a university with students from 150 countries. Is this a great country or what? Just the idea of that length of time, 50 years, and what's happened for those of us blessed to get an education. Well, the answer to the question is, yes, there are many more. Let me prove it to you mathematically. There are 1.3 billion Chinese. There are 1.1 billion Indians. You put those two together, you have 2.4 billion people, right? The top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. What is 10.4, what's 10% of 2.4 billion? Cleveland, no, you're smart. Come on, give me that answer. <laughs> the world is looking, Cleveland. Do you know math, Mr. <laughs> Superintendent? Uh, the 2 .5, the 10 percent of 2.4 billion would be 240 million people, right? You knew that, right? <laughs> Cleveland, right? So 240 million people, how many Americans do we have? About 310. So you have as many geniuses, extraordinarily well-prepared people, as you have citizens. And if you look at engineering programs throughout the country, whether you go to research universities here or my campus, UMBC, you'll see large numbers from those populations. Now, the good news is, as people have come to this country, they have been some of the most entrepreneurial. They have actually been responsible for much of the strength of our science and technology infrastructure. In fact, when you look at Nobel laureates throughout the 20th century, you will see that a disproportionately large percentage of them have come at that time in the 20th century from European countries, often with parents who didn't speak English well. Often the young people would go on to college in New York at what people call the, the poor man's Harvard, uh, 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 City College, Brooklyn College, and go on and get Nobel Prizes whether in the humanities or in the sciences. What is my point? There's something about the hunger that people bring from other countries that should inspire us by every race. When I look at my students who are from Nigeria or the islands, they're focused and they're hungry. When I bring people together from Russia, from China and other places, and I ask them, why is it you work so hard? I get the most fascinating answers. A young woman from the Caribbean said, Dr. Abowski, I don't mean to insult my, my, my fellow friends from, from America. She said, but if I don't excel, my younger brothers and sisters may not eat. She said, so for me, education is not the, the, the icing on the cake. It's the very bread of life. If there were one thing I'd want us to think about broadly in education, it is how do we help our children and our families understand that education is at the heart of the future of every child and of our society. And there's nothing in this world that's more important for us to do in Cleveland, in our country, than to produce many more people who are educated broadly, who are ready to come and become citizens in a special way. Now, what does that mean? It means the broad education and then the math and science. Here's the point. 
My mother had been an English teacher for years and working in middle school, and all of a sudden something came out called the new math. How many people are old enough to remember the new math? <laughs> well, the reason the new math didn't, didn't do as well for all of my friends in higher ed is that we went and we tried to tell the K-12 people what to do, not realizing we should have been partners. Because while we might know the math, actually my PhD is in higher ed and statistics, but the, the fact is that we don't know children the way teachers in schools know children. And we have to come as partners and say, you teach us about children, let us teach you these concepts, let's work together. Instead of doing that, we came knocking, talking about topology, and all of a sudden people got even more afraid of math. All right? Now let me ask you a question. How many people in this room love math? This is a pretty nerdy group. Not bad. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Well, my campus, I want you to know, my, on my campus, math rocks. I mean, we are... I mean, people call me the, the mega nerd, all right? I've got a campus, and on our campus, believe me, chess is powerful. We are either one or two in chess every year, and my basketball team reads well, and they graduate. Give me a hand for that. It's really nice. We believe in talking about scholar-athletes for all of our students, but here's the point in math and science. What has made the difference on our campus is building community among the students. It is saying that we want to set high expectations. It is analyzing through analytics exactly who is succeeding and who is not. It is understanding the backgrounds of students, SATs, grades, attitudes, study habits, in order to say who is it that's succeeding and who is not. It is saying that we refuse to allow first-year science courses to be weed-out courses. You see, the fact is I chaired the National Academy's Committee on Underrepresentation. Believe it or not, it doesn't surprise people that only 20% of African Americans and Hispanics who start in science actually graduate in science. It is stunning as a statistic, though, that only a third of whites who begin in science actually graduate in science and engineering. And often some of the most prestigious institutions and some of the, most, some of the best prepared students have the experience of those really well prepared students with high SATs, high AP courses who don't make it. They change from science to something else. And so it's not just about K through 12, though we want to produce more math and science teachers, though we have to look at K through 8 and the math preparation of middle school teachers as they teach algebra, because to teach algebra, you have to know something at a higher level than algebra, you see. And we have not, if you, if you look at the courses we offer in our colleges called math for elementary school teachers, K through 8, those are not substance courses in terms of the subject matter, they are methodology. So we've got to work on the issue in America of K through 8, giving teachers support to know more math itself, number one. Number two, we have to find ways of getting more students wanting to go into that work. That's K through 12. But at the university level, what has made UMBC a model of inclusive excellence, of innovation, is this notion that we have redesigned first year chemistry, re redesigned first year psychology, and throughout the sciences, and now moving to the humanities, because we know that if more students are to succeed, we have to stop simply lecturing and move to more interactive teaching and learning, using the technology, teaching them how to work in groups. Any of the scientists in the room know people solve problems in groups. We've got to teach students how to collaborate. And most important, we have to set a standard so it's not just about who is smart about a curve, but rather how many students, what percent of the students can reach the goal, get the bar, put the bar high, teach them how to work very hard, and move from there. When my students from America at UMBC see how hard my students from Russia and China and Jamaica work, it pushes them to work even harder. One young woman said she didn't like the fact that the, the woman in her, in, her, in, her, in her own room, her roommate was from another country, and she never saw sleep. Because when she, would, when she would get up in the morning, the girl was already up at working. When she went to bed, the young girl was still at a desk working. She said, I decided at midpoint of the, of the semester, I'm not going to bed until she goes to bed. <laughs> and she said, I'd pinch myself, put water on my face, whatever it took. And I refused to go to bed until she goes to bed. I'd be doing like this, right, right. But I was determined to stay up. And then she said, sometimes I'd wake up before she woke up. I'd get to my desk and study. And it gave me such a sense of satisfaction, she said, to see the woman looking at her while she was studying. She said, but you know, something really strange happened. I said, what? She said, my grades got better. I said, no! <laughs> you don't mean there's a correlation between hard work and grades. Nothing, I don't care how bright someone is, nothing takes the place of hard work. What I want Cleveland to think about is that you want more students and people of all types 
to start thinking about math and science just as we need to think about reading and English and writing. We should stop thinking you're either a math science type or a history English type. How many of you in this room knew by the time you were in the 11th grade that you were, you consider yourself either history and English and art or math and science? Raise your hands. It's an American phenomenon. We have to get away from that. You know, believe it or not, only 6% of the degrees in our country are in math and science and engineering. In uh, European countries, it's about 11%. I was hosting the president of the Korean Institute of Technology. It's 70% in his country. India is in the process of starting, believe it or not, 1,000 new universities because they want to double the percent of students going on. How many of you in this room are between 35 and 70 years old? I have good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? <laughs> bad news is you're getting old. Get over it. It's okay. It's a BC alternative. <laughs> The good news is you are third in the world, third in the world in being well-educated, all right? It's a big deal behind uh, Canada and Israel. Now, how many of you in the room are between 25 and 34? I've got good news and bad news. Which one you want first? <laughs> the bad news is you're not as smart as we are. <laughs> the good news is um, we're jealous. We wish we were your age, okay? <laughs> But the fact is that your group is down in America to number 15. You get my point that other countries are moving ahead of us. This is why the Obama administration and others are saying we've got to educate more people. I want you to think about this. Where would you be today if you had not received a good education? You know, I, I keep thinking about marching in that civil rights movement. I remember so much how our children began to go to college. I heard a man who is the head of one of the school boards in, in Georgia say, Dr. Bowski, it wasn't just blacks who started going to college. He said, I'm from a sharecropping family. I'm a white middle class CEO of a company. He said, when my mother saw the Negro children going, she said, you all are going to college too. And one person went to college and another person went to college. And before I knew it, all my brothers and sisters were teaching and doing other things and getting into businesses. We could move our mother out of sharecropping. But she said, he said this. He said, that movement to move one group at the bottom to the next level helped people across races. And that we must say to ourselves, when we talk about the achievement gap, it's not just about black children and Hispanic children. Millions of America's children of all races are challenged to read, are challenged to do the math. He said, if we can just remember how connected we are, it can make all the difference in the world. I want to close with words from FDR. 25 years after the founding of this, of this club, in 1937, at his installation, he said this, in this nation, I see tens of millions of citizens who at this very moment are denied the greater part of what the very lowest standards of today call the necessities of life. I see millions denied education and the opportunity to better their lot and the lot of their children. I see one third of a nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished. It is not though in despair that I paint you this picture, he said. I paint it for you in hope because this nation, seeing and understanding the injustice in this disparity, will propose to paint it out. In fact, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little dreams and values. Thank you all very much. Dr. Rubowski, thank you for vision, passion, and inspiration. Thank you. Let us give him another round. Today at the City Club, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Dr. Freeman Rubowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. We will return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions for our speaker now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. 
Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. If you wish to make reservations for upcoming programs or order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call at 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. We welcome guests today at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler, Cleveland State University, Cleveland Metropolitan School District, Cuyahoga Community College, Hampton University Alumni Association, Kent State University, The Links Incorporated, and PNC. And again, I would like to specially recognize and welcome Congressman Lewis Stokes, who has joined us here today and is seated at the head table. Today's forum is the Nelson E. Weiss Memorial Forum, made possible by a generous gift from the Friends of Nelson Weiss. Joining us today at the head table is Mr. Weiss's family, daughters Rebecca and Virginia, and son David. Will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. Today's program is also part of the Key Bank Diversity Thought Leadership Series, made possible by a generous gift from Key Bank. Joining us today at the head table is Margot Copeland, Executive Vice President, Director of Corporate Diversity and Philanthropy. Will you please stand and once again be recognized? And now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone today is City Club 100th Anniversary Assistant Director Betsy Wallace and Program Director Carrie Miller. And so may we have the first question, please. Okay. Dr. Rabowski, thank you for a very inspiring story. Yes. Um, I have two sort of questions or comments. One is, uh, a few years ago, probably 20, I had the pleasure of uh, training in your swimming pool at your university. Oh. Mm -hmm. And uh, I very much enjoyed that. Um, it's a lifelong habit. The, the key question, though, is I remember noticing that you had a very unique college mascot huh? for your athletic teams. Yes. And everybody knows the University of Maryland mascot is the Terrapins, but right. I'd like you to tell the audience what yours is. But I have another question that is really more academic. But quickly, it's the retriever, a golden retriever. And what's interesting is that we, uh, we have a um, statue of a retriever. And, the, and the, on campus, the tradition is before you take your finals, you have to rub the retriever's nose. <laughs> it's a very shiny nose, I assure you. <laughs> and half of my athletes are on the dean's list. Give my students a hand for that, please. Half on the dean's list. I thought it was appropriate there was a retriever on the wall in the swimming pool. And yeah, as you're swimming, right. you see it, too. That's exactly that's right. Um, more importantly, um, one of the academic groups that we're leaving out in this country is uh, children who are undocumented in mm. some way, whether, you know, whatever their circumstances is, they get to the United States, they get through high school, and uh, then they find a hard time going on to college uh, because we put limits on whether they can get grants, or in some states, my son is a head of a mentoring program for our high sc for a school system in North Carolina. North Carolina, this, they won't even let them go to the um, the local uh, community colleges uh, if they're undocumented. Yeah. What is being done from your point of view in, in Maryland and at UMBC to deal with that issue and help those kinds of students succeed also? Right. Our challenge, first of all, is that right now our, my campus follows board policy, and you're right, we, we, we uh, admit students, but they, they pay out-of-state tuition. The legislature in our state did vote to allow them to have in-state tuition at the community college level. There is going to be a referendum to see if that will continue to hold. Uh, I recently spoke and said what I really believed, and I thought it was very symbolic. I was doing this, again, 50 years after I marched myself asking this country to allow me to have a good education. I know what a difference a good education has made to me, and I hope I've contributed to American society. I know that anyone who will be able to contribute to our society, 
will first have to have an education that gives that person the skills to get a job, to pay taxes, to take care of family and society. And I think an enlightened society is one that understands it's the education of our children, all our children, that will make all the difference in the world. We will pay one way or the other. We will either support them in education or there will be problems later on. I am very much in favor of education for America's children, very much so. Thanks, Dr. Robowski. I'm sure if your schools, like many other institutions of higher education, you have a group of students who arrive on campus every fall mm -hmm. who just aren't quite ready for the rigors of the, the offerings that you're providing to them. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do to try and deal with that and some suggestions for what we might, uh, might be trying sure. to do? First of all, UMBC situation is a bit different in that I moved us away from development of education a number of years ago because so many of our students are coming from other from very rich backgrounds, academically rich backgrounds, and because half the students are in science and engineering, one, one can't be but so low and expect to make it in biochemistry or engineering. So, so the average SAT math and verbal for our campus is fairly high. It's in the 1200s for all races, quite frankly. Uh, and for all three parts, it's, in, it's literally probably 1900 plus. Uh, and why am I telling you that? Uh, still, even when you have students with all A's and with a fairly high SAT, Compared to the students who come in with almost perfect SATs, they're in trouble. And they don't make it unless you give them special support. Now, what I learned about this comes from my working at an inner city college years ago and with Upward Bound. That whether you're at a place like ours, which is UMBC is an honors campus, it is. We, we take great pride and we like to say that, um, quite frankly, the significance of our university is you don't have to be rich to be brilliant. Give me a hand for that American notion, would you please? <laughs> that you don't have to be rich, you know? Um, just think about it, okay? So we start there. We want to, want to be as smart as possible. Well, I want every child to be as smart as possible. We work with a lot of K through 12 children, children who are first time offenders. This is what we're doing. We're working to help children who have had difficulties, who don't have strong family backgrounds, to support those families, but to support those boys. We supervise 500 little boys mainly boys, mainly black, but some Hispanic, some poor white kids, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've been doing it 20 some years. And we've been, been able to keep the program because our, our governor and, and the legislature have understood the need for these kinds of programs and devaluation. What we do is we're working on reading skills, teaching them to want to be smart, getting them on the college campuses. More children need to be on college campuses to aspire to it. They need to understand how important reading is quite frankly, and then most important, it seems to me we have to teach children, whether they're 17 or 12, the discipline of work. Nothing takes the place of the discipline of work. And so with these children, as they're working with my students, they're learning just that. And so even though I tell you students are fairly well prepared, they are not prepared for the rigors of engineering, quite frankly, at the university level, because few high school students have become accustomed to studying four or five hours a night of any race. They tend to think you wait until the night before the test. And so what we're doing is giving much more orientation. My line is look to your left, look to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate. And if you don't, we fail and we don't plan to fail. Give us a hand for that, please. Very important. So it's the intrusion and working with them constantly, using the technology, getting them to work in groups at every level that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Robowski, you, you spoke about your personal involvement many years ago in the civil rights movement. Uh, there was a time when students and universities were very involved in the issues of the day, yes. whether it was civil rights, uh, the war in Vietnam, yes. uh, the environment, yes. or what have you. Yes. But lately, there seems to be uh, uh, less interest in that on the part of students. They're more interested in getting their degree and getting a good job and all that goes with it. And to what extent do you think that uh, the universities, such as yours, uh, can help to encourage students? Sure to get back and give their enthusiasm and their knowledge and yes. all their wherewithal to the very pressing social issues of, t of today? I think I appreciate the question. I would say that I think we as university presidents and leaders need to make sure the public knows what we're doing. I have thousands of students out in communities working, helping children every day. Uh, working to help children, helping senior citizens. We've got a major project in this American Commonwealth project is focused on this value of civic education, of, of what does it mean to be a citizen? How do we contribute beyond just our taxes by giving of ourselves? And so large numbers of my students really are involved in the sticky issues of the day. And I, I find that at a number of campuses, it's just that the public doesn't hear about it. You see, in the 60s or 70s, the public would hear about people out 
marching and demonstrating, but there are other ways of being very involved. I, to me, for a college student, getting involved in helping children who are needing to learn to read and to aspire to go to college is as important as anything they could be doing right now. We need to look at how much that's happening to document it and publicize it and to encourage many more to do it. Because if students don't learn to help others in college, they won't have time beyond that. They, if you learn to do something, you do it a lot. And if you do it in college, you're more likely to do it when you leave college. And that's why colleges should be the place where leaders are learning to give back and serve. I would agree with you totally. I really would. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Freeman. Hey, Michael. Um, one of your greatest accomplishments, I think, is the Meyerhoff Scholars. Thank you. And they have succeeded as undergraduates and then gone on to some of the most prestigious graduate schools in yes. the country. Yes. Can you share with us a little of that magic of the special support system that. that you innovated yes. to make them successful? Yes. Let me start by saying it was Robert Meyerhoff, who is a Jewish philanthropist in our area, uh, who uh, said, Years ago, he wanted to see what he could do with his wife, Jane Meyerhoff, at the time, the late Jane Meyerhoff, to make a difference in the lives of African-American males. He said, everything I see on TV, with the exception of sports, is negative about black males. Now, this is someone who just said, I want to make a difference. What can I do? And we were trying to figure out a way of improving the performance of African-Americans and other minorities in science, because they were not doing well, as they aren't doing well most places still. We married the two ideas. So he is this co-founder, and we worked together. And he gave us the first money for that program. And then we were able to get, and he has continued to give us some. And we've got national money. We have one of the, I direct a grant called the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Participation. You've got it in this area, I'm sure, all over the country, these programs named after this legendary visionary, focus on helping more minorities make it in science. So what we've done with what's interesting is, and this is the National Science Foundation, and we get funds from the National Institutes of Health, from the National Security Agency, all these places. The key is to find students with this passion for math and science, to find students who are willing to take advice, to pull them together. We started with young men, but then the second year and on, we've had young women. We now have white students interested in underrepresentation, who are at least 35% of the program, in fact. And the key is this. In terms of African Americans, the numbers have actually, at one point it was 100. We now have almost 1,000 who graduated, either graduated or still there. But we have hundreds and hundreds of African American MD PhDs. Unheard of, all right? PhDs in engineering from Stanford to MIT. And how did it happen? The faculty. For anyone in the university, it takes researchers to produce researchers. The only way you get people to the point of being able to work in labs and, is to have faculty working with the prog program and with the students in the labs, but also to make sure the first two years of the work, of the academic work, are solid. I would argue that if students get C's in the first year of science and engineering, it's pretty much over. Because math and science are sequentially based. You need freshmen getting A's and B's to build a solid foundation on which they can keep moving to the next level. And that was what we had to do. We had to find ways of building that foundation so they could move to the next level. The most important point is what worked for the Meyerhoffs and minorities, we then replicated and used for students in general. So we have redesigned courses. We have groups now. And it works so well in science. We now have communities in the other disciplines, Linehan artist scholars, Dress of Humanities scholars, Center for Women in IT, uh, the Sherman scholars in math science teaching. The point is communities of students working together, supporting each other, with faculty being very involved can make all the difference in the world with high expectations. You know what I say to students that sounded crazy at first? I don't just want you to get an A, an A. I want you to get a high A. I want you to not be going, I got an A. I want you to be questioning the work itself. I want you to know what it is to know for the A and go beyond that. It's the Browning quote, oh, that a man's reach should exceed his grasp of what's a heaven for. That's what Meyerhoff means. It's excellence and inclusiveness. And quite frankly, that has become UMBC's thought. We are a model of inclusive excellence. US News had us tied with Yale University in quality of undergrad education. Big hand for that, please, all right? <laughs> yes, last question. 
you. It's been a real honor and a blessing to hear you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering whether, in addition to the flipped classroom model that yes. you mentioned, moving from lecture into yes. a more interactive learning yes. environment, yes. Uh, are there any particular technologies yes. uh, that you have noticed have been especially effective in, cre in increasing STEM learning? Thank you so it's much. Excellent. I, I would suggest that you go to our uh, Chemistry Discovery Center first and you will see the way they're using terminals on, can on each desk with a master terminal. And what's interesting is you have groups of four randomly assigned. Each person has a role as a project manager as a blogger, they've got these roles and they change roles. We don't give them the theories in chemistry. They have to discover the theories. We use problems out of the biotech companies on the campus to make it real. We, and they have some lecture and discussion, but much of the real interaction involves the students discussing, fighting. When you go into the room, it sounds like a party. They're laughing and they're arguing. They're very involved. How many of you know that young people, whether in the sixth grade or in college, tend to be bored in class? All right. We have to get them engaged in the work. The new study that came out from the Ithaca group with Bill Bowen, uh, we were involved in, in statistics. And it was a hybrid course, which I think will be the future of much of higher education and in, at the K-12 level, where you have a part of it that the student can do online, and then another part that will be done in lecture form. I just lectured at the uh, Blackboard conference on course management. And what, what's really significant about Blackboard and course management is that you have so much work going on in the discussion board that the faculty member understands more about what students understand and don't understand, and therefore the lecture can be geared towards the part that is most important to gaining an understanding of what's not understood. That's very different from the broad lecture where people already know half of what you're talking about. So technology can be used to pinpoint specifically the, the real problems in understanding in order to move to the next level. Mm -hmm. Dr. Robowski, uh, it seems as though a great deal of our work around STEM and uh, diversifying STEM uh, disciplines and moving uh, under underrepresented groups into those areas focuses on access. Yes. Getting those students to the right type of education, yes. the right type of people, the right circumstance. Much of what you talked about today seemed to be about aspiration. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you might share a little bit more about how, about that idea of affirming, not just getting students where they need to be, but the notion of aspiration, their aspiration, sure. the aspiration of their parents sure. and caregivers and sure. where that fits into this. Sure. I think it's an excellent point. It's not enough to talk about access. It has to be aspirations and success, those two things. I think it's very important for families and school systems to know two things. If you're sending someone on to college, you want to connect. What happens right now is we send people on and then we say, well, they went to that place. We rarely have done the kind of execution that says, okay, how did they do once they got there? By discipline. And I would argue that, first of all, we need to understand the relationships between K-12 through and universities. What happens when they go to community colleges, to four-year institutions? Do they make it or not? If they don't make it, what do we need to do? One of the big problems in America is developmental mathematics. A very large percent of students who start in college start with developmental mathematics. And the probability of a student who starts in developmental math completing a four-year degree is under 0.25. That's the challenge right there. So there is the first point. I mean, getting them through that. Some of the more enlightened places are now having students take placement exams while in high school to see where they would place in college so that they can go ahead and get that work done and reinforce concepts early enough so that by the time they finish high school, they know they won't place in developmental math. It's a real challenge, you know, because one of our major issues is that, unfortunately, the probability of a student who is first-generation college graduating from college is very low, very different from 30 years ago. If you heard me say only 10%, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, had a college degree. So the fact that somebody had made it meant that we were still moving people through the process. That's our big challenge right now. And I would argue that giving students and families and schools a chance to see role models, all the people who've made it, in, whether in law or in medicine and science and humanities, and to understand the stories of people who've made it can inspire people. Stories inspire. You know, every time I think about my mama who was a little child made, learning to read, being inspired by the books and the reading, and Zora Neale Hurston, and then going on and becoming an English teacher, and inspiring other people. It shows me the, the transformative power of education. We need those stories so that people will want to be like other people. You're absolutely right. 
Beach, right? Dr. Rabowski, yes. thank mm -hmm. you for your inspiring message. Mm -hmm. What resources or toolkits do you have available to help parents yes. support their students to yes. supplement what we might be doing in the school systems? It's a great one, and I'll pay you later the, uh, for that. The, um, uh, my colleagues and I wrote a couple of books that are amazing, um, and I can say it because all the world just goes to the college, uh, but the fact is beating the odds and overcoming the odds for minority kids. Uh, one is on bo black boys, one on black girls, and they're on helping kids learn how to make it in science and what parents can do. Quite frankly, we listened to the, to the voices of parents of successful students. So often when we talk about inner city kids or we talk about minority kids or poor white kids, we use a deficit model. We wanted to understand what are the strengths that we can talk about, the resilience. Sometimes when a child just gets to school in the morning, given the hell that she's been through, she is resilient. She's bounced back. You know, and so I, I would suggest those books, Beating the Odds, Overcoming the Odds, Oxford Press, and then looking, quite frankly, it seems to me, at literature that focuses on how schools and uh, parents can work together. I was talking with the superintendent about one of my mentees who focuses on specifically home visits. You know, David Heber with his company really looks at how do we train people to go into those homes and give those mothers or grandmothers support and to help them to know something that may sound very basic. And what is it? That if your child is not in school, obviously your child is not going to do well academically. That somehow the child has to be in school to learn, right? And yet kids miss a lot of days of school. And they get behind. And once they get behind, what happens is it's hard to catch up. And then they'll start acting out, especially for the boys. And so we have to use uh, resources materials and professionals who can help us think through how to connect to those families. Sometimes you can't get the family to come to the house. How do we get to those homes? And let them know without judging them, we need your help. Because I would argue that that mama or that grandmama is the number one expert on that child. And we need to recognize her strength and let her know we need her strength to help her child. That would be my argument. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes, uh -huh. Yes, I'm sorry. I was very glad to hear what you said about the academic success of your basketball team, but that's clearly not the case at all universities. Right. And it seems to me that one of the challenges that we face as a society and that you face in higher education in terms of uh, building the number of degree holders in STEM disciplines mm -hmm. is the overemphasis that we place on sports and in some ways in which sports have even corrupted higher education. I think the Penn State disaster is only the most recent and maybe most egregious example of that. But I wonder if you'd reflect on that. I mean, do you agree with me, first of all? But secondly, then, what ought we to be doing about it? What ought higher education sure. be doing about it? You know, I think we start by recognizing all of the ways in which athletic programs have helped young people to get an education to be disciplined. I think there is something to be said about that. Uh, we start with that, that, that historically many people have aspired to go to college because they wanted to play athletic, to be in athletics. And, and whether we like it or not, kids get inspired by that. I do think our society has gone too far with athletics and entertainment. All I need to do is ask you what you think about when you hear two words, American Idol. It's not about physics. <laughs> it's not about literature, all right? It's about entertainment. All we're talking about things in sports, okay? And so I would agree with you that we have to rethink the balance between them. I think that athletics and athletic activities can be very helpful to young people in a sound body. There's no doubt about that, but we need a sound mind too. We need, and what I would, what my campus does, what faculty and staff work to do is to have that balance. And so when I tell you we have half the athletes on the dean's list, it's a big deal. Whether it's in lacrosse or in tennis, I mean, in soccer, people are working to have that balance. And it does mean that you don't always win, but it means that you want students to graduate and to be able to read and think well and get good jobs. I tell our students, we, we consider you student athletes, all right? You're students, human beings first, students second, and athletes third. And the question every institution has to ask is, what's the order? What's the order? That's our order. We, we take great pride in that. We really do. We really do. Mm -hmm. The uh, programs which you have instituted are very inspiring. And I would like you to go back to the fundamental issue for the cause of the achievement gap, whether yes. it be racially, 
or nationally, as you point out, various countries mm -hmm. in the United States, and that is the lack of fire in the belly at an early stage. Right. How it's there, yeah. how does, do we instill that in our children? Right, right. It's a great question. There are two achievement gaps. It's the gap between uh, poor children of all races and middle class children, particularly middle class white children and Asian children, and then it's the gap between our very best and the best in other countries because we still are in the bottom half in math and science. Here's what I would say. We really do want to emphasize to our country the important role families need to play, number one. We need to help parents understand that they can help more with math than they may think. You don't have to be able to solve the math problem to help with math. What my books talk about and what a lot of people will tell you is you want to be able to show interest. All you have to do is to ask the, the, the student, how many problems did you have? Have you tried to solve them? Can you solve them? If you can, great. But if you can't, go ask the teacher and tomorrow tell me what you learned. So I want to see families more involved. I want to see communities more involved in after school programs. And most important, I want to see us getting excited about both math and science and reading. I challenge you, Cleveland, to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful audience. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Dr. Freeman Rabowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Thank you, Dr. Rabowski. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And this forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.